What's up, gang? Welcome to The Greatness Machine. I'm your host, Darius from Shaw's Day. I'm so pumped to have you here with me. Now listen, The Greatness Machine, we're about two things. Number one, people who are living their passions. And number two, those who are creating greatness in the world and doing both of these things despite the odds against them. Each episode, we're going to feature interviews with game changers, business leaders, you know, telling us their origin stories, what made them tick, what got them to where they are now. Why? So it can help you step into your greatness within your life, your business, and your career. Occasionally, you might hear a few solo episodes from myself, moi, as I say, as I leverage my 20 years of entrepreneurship as a CEO and founder to help you grow and level up in your journey to scale your life and your business. So come be a fly on the wall, enjoy the conversation, and I'm stoked to have you here with me. Guys, welcome to today's episode of The Greatness Machine. I'm your host, Darius Mershaw. Today, and boy, do we have a special guest. My man, Kevin Hines, is in the house. What's up, Kevin? Hey, Darius. Nice to see you. Oh, my gosh, man. Great to see you. Um, I am so pumped to have you here. Do you mind, before I get started, if I do a little bit of housekeeping, and then we'll jump right into the show? Go for it. All right, let's do it. So, for audience who is new to the episode, new to the show, The Greatness Machine, we are about two things. People who have lived their passions and those creating greatness in the world and doing so despite the odds. And man, is my man Kevin neither short of passion nor greatness. We're going to be talking about some... This is probably one of the the harder subject materials we're going to be covering today. When you think of greatness, uh, I don't think this is going to be the first thing that pops in people's mind, but it is definitely an amazing thing. And um, so, I want to take a step back. So, I met Kevin... Um, I want to say it was at mi- it's 2013, so it was a minimum of 10 years ago, and it might have been 11 years ago. And for listeners who listen to the show not a lot, uh, even if you listen to the first 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 episode, you'll know the origin story of the show is this: the show was born out of TEDx Golden Gate Park. And so when we were doing this, is again a decade ago, uh, Kevin had connected with me, I, and I don't know how it had happened. We had a lot of people that were connecting with us because we were picking speakers for the event, and Kevin had connected with me over his story which is a harrowing story, an amazing story about his overcoming his suicide attempt. And, um, and so I, I was like, man, I really want like him to be in the part of the talk, but shit, we have like, like I already have a full speaker. I have a full house. I have backup speakers. I'm like, Oh man, I guess it didn't work out. And this is a San Francisco story. And this was happening in San Francisco, but it didn't happen. But uh, fast forward to this past year. Um, and you know, we, we got connected through LinkedIn during that time frame, And I, and I've been, you know, passively following you just so you know, Kevin, over the last decade, just because your story was so interesting. Um, ended up seeing the movie, the bridge after that, and that features your story. Um, but really followed you passively and through social media. And I asked my team, I said, Hey, let's reach out to Kevin. I think it'd be a great guest on the show. So a uh, man, I'm so pumped to have you here to talk about you, your story, all the amazing stuff you're, you're doing in the world, uh, in the world of suicide prevention, um, but man, welcome to the show, and I'm so pumped for us to get to dig into everything that you're doing in this world today. So thanks, man. Darius, thank you for having me. I really appreciate it. I'm, I'm glad to be here with you. Yeah, that's so great. So um, do you mind if I do, I'm going to give your formal bio really quickly, and then and then I'd love okay. for us to talk a little bit about, about your origin story. Like, like I'd love for us to kind of go back, because your story is, is, like I said, it's a unique story for the greatness machine. Um, a lot, a lot of the times we're talking about the other side of, of people's, uh, world, which is, oh, I built this business or I did this movie and it's always based off this thing they strive for yours is way different. And, but it, but nonetheless, super important, probably the most important because it comes down to saving people's lives, which I think is, there's no greater gift that we can give to the world than, than for folks to, to stay here as long as they, they can and to do it in a healthy way. Um, but do you mind if I do that? I'm going to jump into your, your I'm going to kind of give your form bio and then I'd love to hear a little bit of the origin story. Does that work? Go for it. All right, let's do it. So uh, Kevin, Mr. Kevin Hines, he's the host of the Hindsight's podcast, author of the book, Crack Not Broken. He's a mental health and suicide prevention advocate. Featured His story was featured in the documentary, the, the award-winning documentary, Br- The Br- uh, Bridge. And he's also a filmmaker. Uh, we're going to be learning about his film, Suicide, The Ripple Effect. And um, man, like you were doing such amazing work in the world of suicide prevention. I'd love for you to just kind of take us back. Like, how did you get into this world? You know, t- talk about, you know, your story a little bit. Cause your story is, 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 um, um, there's a technical uh, term for this. It's fucking insane, right? This is crazy <laughs> fucking story. Um, and, and, and I don't have, I, I just gave the textbook definition of, <laughs> of it, um, but yeah, man, if, if you, if you don't mind, like take it, take us back, tell us a little bit about your background and, and tell us the story. I, I'd love for our audience to hear it. Well, 
first and foremost, Darius, I've never had an intro like that before, so thank you. Um, <laughs> uh, you know, as if we're gonna, if we're gonna lean on the comical side for this one. I'll, I'll tell you, my dad always is fond of saying, "I fell into the work <laughs> of suicide prevention." <laughs> And some people might find that offensive, but that's their problem. I've lived with this my whole life with bipolar disorder. I literally did. And it was it was not by, by choice. I was compelled uh, by literally auditory hallucinations in my head and severe depression followed by a, a skyrocketing mania living with bipolar depression. Uh, it, it, it did. It led me to attempt to take my life in a way that is 99.99% fatal. I leapt off the Golden Gate Bridge in an attempt to take my life. And people have come from all over the world to take their life at the Golden Gate Bridge. But the majority of people who take their life there are young and in, in the San Francisco Bay Area. And, and I went there at 19, believing beyond a shadow of a doubt that I had to take my life, that I had to die, that I had no other option, no other choice. And I went there because of an unimaginable amount of despair, hopelessness, and helplessness. And if I had just recognized back then what I know today, that my thoughts don't have to become my actions, they can simply be my thoughts, everything would have been a little bit different. Nonetheless, I did go there on September 25th, the year 2000, to end my life. Thank the Lord I survived what I did. Where thousands of people have done what I did and are gone forever. Their families mourn them each and every waking moment of every single day. I know a lot of those families. I work with a lot of those families. I survived my fall. And... The initial only reason I survived that fall was, was really threefold. I, I call them my three miracles. The first thing that occurred, when I leapt over the rail, a woman driving by at the moment of my attempt saw me go over and called her friend from her car phone in the year 2000. It wasn't a cell phone, it was a car phone. Most of us don't know what that is called her friend from her car phone in the United States Coast Guard who happened to be manning the waters of the bridge at that moment. The only reason the Coast Guard boat arrived to my position in the water before I would set in hypothermia and drown in those frigid waters below the bridge was because of that woman's phone call. In the water, before the Coast Guard boat arrived, I was drowning. I kept going down. I couldn't stay above water. My boots were waterlogged. My long sleeve clothing was heavy. I was in a bad place and I was about to drown. And I remember thinking to myself, I can't die here. If I die here, no one's going to ever know I didn't want to. No one's going to ever oh, know shit. I knew I made a mistake because the moment my hands left the rail, Darius, I had what's called an instantaneous regret for my actions and the absolute recognition that I had just made the greatest mistake of my life and it was too late for 99.99% of the people who've done what I did. It's too late. Something began to circle beneath me and I freaked out. I thought you got to be kidding me. I didn't die jumping off the golden gate bridge and a shark is going to devour me. Perfect. And I'm punching this thing with my one good arm trying to make it go away, but it's not going anywhere. It's now circling faster and faster beneath me but it's bumping me up. No longer am I waiting or treading in the water. I'm lying atop it on my back, being kept buoyant by this creature circling beneath my shoulders, my knees, and my elbows. And I still think it's like a nice shark. Well, it turned out I was on a television program sometime later promoting a suicide prevention campaign. I said on the show, I thought there was a shark beneath. People wrote into the show from all over the world. One man's letter stuck out. His name was Morgan. He was from Las Vegas, Nevada. He was on the bridge that day with his mom. And he wrote to me through ABC News. And he said, Kevin, I'm so very glad you're alive. I was standing less than two feet away from you when you jumped. Until this oh, no day, way. watching this show, no one would tell me whether you lived or died. It's haunted me until right now. 
By the way, Kevin, there was no shark, but there absolutely was a sea lion. And the people above looking down believed it to be keeping your body afloat until the Coast Guard boat arrived behind you. If that's not a miracle, Darius, I don't know what it is. This creature that doesn't speak my language saved my life. Absolutely, beyond a shadow of a doubt, saved my life. There were witnesses after that that went to the Coast Guard and said what they saw. Uh, they've done an investigation about this. It was incredible. Now, from that, that was the first two miracles. The third miracle is when the, when, the, when the Coast Guard got me to the ambulance and the ambulance got me to the hospital, I was having a violent asthma attack. I have exercise-induced asthma. My breather was in my right pocket. They could not administer my inhaler because they didn't know if my lungs had been impacted or impaled. So they couldn't give me any medication. They could only give me oxygen. I get to the hospital. And one of the foremost back surgeons on the West Coast happens to be there. He wasn't supposed to. He was supposed to be, already be gone. He stayed to do my surgery, the first and only of its particular kind. He invented it for me. Never been done before. Never been done again. Saving me the ability to stand, walk, and run. If it wasn't for Dr. Jonathan Levin, I wouldn't be in the shape I am today. And I have, I have titanium all throughout my back, replacing three shattered vertebrae, uh, a titanium mesh wire cage, four pins the size of my index fingers, and a metal plate the size of my palm to my left side. Um, Darius, I get to be here. And getting to be here, I believe, wholeheartedly, is a privilege and a gift, no matter the pain one might be in. And I know there are a lot of people probably listening and watching your show right now who are in a world of pain and they are silencing their pain because of fear and shame, fear of how people will react around them or, or not react and shame for their own struggles, for their own tragedies. Um, and they're in desperate pain and they're dying because of it. And it's awful. I'm trying to, I mean, my wife and I uh, have been traveling the world, sharing this and other stories, trying to help people stay. That's my goal. I have uh, no other true ambitions. I want to make media that saves lives. I want to write books that save lives. I want to make comic books that save lives. I want to do everything in my power to help keep people here. I don't have a complex, a savior complex. I, I, I know I'm just a conduit. I'm a messenger. I give a message. People go home. They do the work. They're saving and changing their own lives. Uh, but hundreds of thousands of people have told me I've saved theirs. I, I want them to realize how much they put in the effort to change their perspective, their perception, and their entire destiny. Wow, well, man. That's the... Uh... Normally, when people talk for nine minutes straight in the opening, I'm like, "All right, they got to slow down." I I need to ask a question, but uh, that was the first that was the first time I've been like, "No, I keep it coming, man. This is some fucking amazing, um, powerful, uh, dude." I got like like my skin's crawling right now. Um, so let me take a step back. Um, obviously, you were 19, you're a teenager, you're you know, it was there's a lot of science around the fact that the prefrontal lobe is not fully developed, that we don't yeah. make the best decisions when we're, you know, that age. Were you, was that the first suicide attempt you'd ever had? Had you thought about suicide before that? Or was that the, like, tell us a little bit about that. Yeah. Uh, I had, uh, I had two previous, I had one previous attempt and one near attempt. Um, the previous attempt. So I was 19 when I jumped, when I was 18, I was very close to taking my life and I, I won't really get into it except to say that I happen to be in the middle of reading Dwayne, the rock Johnson's book, the rock says, and in that book, there is a passage that he writes about defeating depression through faith. And it hit me right then, right there while I was 
almost attempting. I had remembered that it was in a specific part in the book. I went back to the book as I was hurting myself and I, I just sat and cried. I just sat in my room and cried. That book at that time saved my life. There was a secondary incident where I had locked myself in my room and uh, I, I was listening to DMX, may he rest in peace, Earl, Earl Simmons, Dark Man X, the rapper. Um, and I was once again about to take my life and I had started and then the, the CD was playing as I was doing this, the, the song, the convo comes on where he's praying and he says, Lord, I'm in so much pain. Please take me away. And then God says, no, I put you here to do a job and your work ain't done to live is to suffer, but you're still my son. And there will be a time when you shine as bright as the stars, but there won't be a his or hers, just ours. And I, I, I dropped what I was doing. I got my sh shit together and I, I stopped everything. And I, I didn't tell anybody. Uh, but eventually my counselor found out in high school and, and told my parents what I had done. Uh, and, and they didn't, they didn't believe me. Um, they didn't believe their child could do that. Wow. So hold, hold on. So, so when you're, yeah. let me ask a question. So you're, so you're, so how did your counselor find out? Sorry, I missed that part. Uh, I, I had a visible wound on my body. Oh, okay. Okay. So, so, so someone had, you're in high school at this point, I'm assuming, right? It was in high school. And really yeah, so what you're happened, in high school. What happened is uh, one of the life students, and in, uh, at my high school, Archbishop Britton High School, if you're a life student, your your duty is to be of service to all the other students in your class. And so one of the kids had seen something I had done, went to the counselor that I was already seeing. He called me into his office, a whole rigmarole, and they called my parents. And, and so, so I, I mean, it's it's interesting now, My you know, I think we're – I'm a maybe I'm 44. You're you're like late 30s, early 40s. Is that right? Early 40s, yeah. Yeah, yeah. So we're not too far in age. So so you're probably at a point. I mean, obviously you're at a point in your life where you you're doing this work. So I'm sure what I'm about to say is like that's just an, unfortunately another day at the office, right? Like where where you're talking to people whose kids are you know attempting suicide or threatening to attempt suicide, and now it's like the I mean the data around this is crazy. Like it's it's, it's more yeah. prevalent than ever, right? And so uh, I'm what's that? It's a travesty what's happening in, in, in America and around the world with, with youth suicide. Right. So this is an epidemic that's getting worse. Right. Um, and, and, and when you, it's interesting, well, I'll, I'll go there next, but I want to go back to your situation. So why do you think, I mean, I found that my friends and I have some friends who, who, who are really, you know, pretty hardcore activists about this because they they've seen friends kids take their lives and so i'm in groups where a lot of them are entrepreneur groups where it makes the threat like we're all over it where we're like hey like dude take it seriously here's the steps here's who they need to talk to do not fucking take this lightly you know you don't want to like you know and and so i i can understand as being a parent right and you know i'm a parent of two kids like like no one wants to think that of their kids because they love their kids more than themselves. Right. That's part, part of being like, like at least that's been my experience. And so do you think your parents were in denial? Like, what do you think it was that made them feel that way? Like, what, like, did you talk to them about that at all? Yeah. You know, I see it all the time. They were divorced. And I, I think that, I think they couldn't believe that their son would do something like that. And why would they want to believe that? Who wants to believe that? I totally empathize. I totally empathize with what they were going through at the time, I mean, they, they came full circle and, and they both have my back today, uh, in a big way. Um, and they're there for me. Uh, but, but, you know, there were times when we didn't see eye to eye and, uh, you know, I hadn't been the most honest with what I was going through. So how, so they were iffy about believing me in the first place or trusting me if that's the right word. Uh, you know, um, but I do want to say something. I want to say thank you to Roger Alaria for alerting the counselor, Mr. Martin Boccaccio. Um, because 
because at that time it shifted me to getting the help I needed at that moment. I got worse later on many times, but Roger was there to see me for who I was and to make sure I was safe. And that's exactly what people need to be doing. People that are doing well with their brain health need to be there and have a social responsibility for people who are suicidal. We need to be our, uh, each other's best advocates, if you will. Um, and I want to say something. Roger has is now uh, is is right currently now a patrol officer saving lives at the Golden Gate Bridge. Oh wow! Yeah, yeah, and he's been doing that for years, and he's incredible, and he is a gift to us all, and he saved lots of lives. Uh, and this was and. And was this, sorry, was that the, the kid who was the life officer or was that the, the counselor? The life student. Yeah, he was. He was. Wow. Well, wow. and were you friends with him or was, did you even know oh, him or no? Buddies. Yeah, we're, yeah, we're still friends. Yeah, of course. Got it. Got it. And so, um, so uh, up until that point, I mean, what do you think was the driving, like driving part of your, you know, I mean, you, you said you were diagnosed bipolar were you, was this something that had you had suffered with young at a younger age too? Were you a depressed kid? Like, like what, what kind of led you into this part of your life? Well, before I get into that, I will say this. I've never suffered a day in my life. Uh, and I want to, I want to preface that with this. Every clinician I used to have told me I was suffering from depression, suffering from bipolar disorder, suffering from mental illness, suffering from eating disorders when I was, and I was big time, not ashamed to say it as a man. They all told me I was suffering, and I adopted that narrative as my own, and I became a sufferer. I wrote about it. I blogged about it. I made movies about it. Uh, but that only made me the victim of my own story. Mm. Until I realized one day that I could fight my pain, battle my pain, live with my pain, and thrive despite of my pain, thus becoming the hero of my journey. And you don't probably know this, but even though I was born in abject poverty, in and out of crack motels, being fed Kool-Aid, Coca-Cola, and sour milk as my first diet, I've never suffered a day in my life. I've been given a coveted second chance at it, and I just believe it's a matter of perspective, which is why earlier on I said that, that the, the, the pain we experience is also a gift. Because you can let your pain defeat you, or you can let it build you brick by brick from the ground up until you're stronger than ever. And I choose the latter. I love that, man. So when you went to, you know, and so I appreciate the, the context because I think some people might, you know, understanding that helps us understand the moment where you went for the, the attempt off, off the Golden Gate Bridge. So, you know, you said earlier in the show that when you were, you know, you climbed over the railing, is that correct? And then let, and then basically let go to fall off. Tell us about no, that. I, I, I ran back toward the traffic railing, sprinted forward and catapulted over the rail. Oh shit. I was like, on no head cord. first. Yeah. I was on no cord to be talked back to safety. I was in. Whoa, whoa, whoa. So you, so wait, you dove head first over. I touched my arms to the rail and threw my whole body over and I was falling head first. Holy shit. How, like, how quick do you remember that? Instant, like, instant regret. The, the, the millisecond my hands left the rail, I wanted to go back. And I didn't, I was like, what have I just done? And, and I just, well, how I just, long? I just, I just prayed on the four second fall down. I just prayed. What have I just so done? Four seconds. You saved me. It's four second fall. Four seconds. And, yeah. and were you, what did you feel during that moment, the, during those four oh, seconds? Like, what people was, don't understand. It's, it's like shards of, glass or hitting your skin because you're you're going against the fog and the fog is like razors on your skin and so it you're was, feeling p pain you're realizing was, was, i mean this was is brutal. was it yeah. was it a long long four seconds or was it like oh, a oh, like, it like that and then you Just, hit the and then you hit hit the water i hit the water and hitting that water from that height at that speed you 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 get very close to terminal velocity almost 80 miles per hour and so most so people, is that like 
Most hitting people, cement, right? It's like hitting a cement. It's like hitting a brick wall. You stop for less than a second, and then a vacuum sucks you under seventy feet because of the velocity at which you fell. You you impact the water with fifteen thousand pounds of pressure. Holy shit! That's why most people die upon impact. Because what people don't get, and this is this is a misnomer, and I want to clear it up. For all the people considering suicide off any bridge, for that matter. You are you are looking at one of the most violent, awful deaths you can possibly imagine to anybody who is considering suicide. It's not the answer. Suicide is never the solution to your problem. It is the problem. If you're going through hell right now, j- just because you're going through hell right now doesn't mean you don't get to have that beautiful tomorrow, but you have to be here to get there in the first place. And everybody now these days wants the uberfication of their life right now. They want that one pill that's going to get them in shape. They want that uh, one exercise that's going to make them feel better. No, you have to put in the work, the time, the energy, and the effort. You have to read every book on the diagnosis you've been given, whether physical, mental, or otherwise. You have to educate yourself about how to become your own best advocate if you are going to survive in today's society. And and one of the biggest things that I see today that breaks my heart uh, is parents who will hand their two-year-old child a mobile device at dinner at, at a restaurant because they're screaming and crying. We have forgotten how to attend to our children in real time because parents that are parenting now never grew up without cell phones or mobile devices. So they're addicted to them. Their children are addicted right. to them at an age they shouldn't be. And it's not just social media I'm talking about. I'm talking about making that center for entertainment for your child so they be quiet at a, at a restaurant. It used to be that we connected to our child, understood what their screams and cries meant because their screams and cries are their way of communicating. Right. And it either means I'm hungry, I'm tired, I'm sick, or I, I just poop my pants. Well, you know, one of the two, one of the four. <laughs> Right? right, so you have to be attuned to those messages, but instead of doing that, we're just handing them a device and saying, "Be quiet." And then yeah, they're the- being addicted to that device and the lights that come from it, and it's augmenting their brain as a two-year-old. How do you think they're going to do when they're when they're thirteen and they're on TikTok or on or on uh, uh, Facebook or Instagram? Not well, because their brains haven't fully developed, but their brains have been developing through these stages with devices they were never meant to touch. And so my point in all this is that we've lost the art of true communication with our children, with our loved ones, with our family, our friends, and our colleagues. When's the last time you were on a bus and you didn't see everyone on that bus like this on their phone? Oh, man, I I was in uh, the airport. I landed in SFO uh, from Austin a a month ago. Uh, Yeah, it was a month ago. Um, and I, I remember I had this moment, I live in Austin, Texas now. Uh, we were yeah. talking earlier. We're both, we're both San Francisco guys for the audience that doesn't know this, but, um, I think I mentioned it earlier, but I, I get off and I'm in terminal two, which is the, the, it used to be the Virgin terminal, but the Alaska airlines. Right. And I'm walking yeah. through and it's a nice, it's a really beautiful terminal. They got a lot of good restaurants and stuff in there. So I always like that terminal and I'm looking and it was funny, man. I had this moment where I look and everyone's on their phones. I just watch Every- everyone. And, and I remember right. I was thinking to myself, and I do it too, like when I'm sitting there bored, I'll just, you know, listen to a book yeah, or some shit. Right. I do it too. You know, um, I don't do it when I'm with my kids though. Mm. You know, I, I, because, because I, well, I, no, I'm not, I, I don't want my kids on the phone. So, right. so I don't do it. I don't do it when I'm with my kids. I don't want them on the phone when we're around each other. Like we're around each other. It's time we get to spend together. Um, yeah. or we're on the plane, they could sit on the phone and watch a movie or some stuff. I don't mind, but but I remember I saw that, and uh, I'll, I'll finish my thought. I was looking, and I was like, "Wow, this is not good." And I've had that no. moment many times. Sometimes, sometimes I'll take pictures of it. I'll be like, "Look at all these fucking people. Get off your fucking yeah. phones. Be humans. Don't be like whatever that is." You know? Yeah, I mean, so, I, I, yeah. I don't want to. I don't want to vilify anybody, but we live in a society where our priorities are all fucked up. We, we want instant gratification for everything. Where do you get your food? Uber Eats. Where do you get your car? Uber. Where do you get your groceries? Uh, 
Instacart. It's out of control. Instacart. Nobody goes and does anything anymore. Nobody's walking every morning like my wife and I do to experience nature anymore. Not nobody, but a, but a great many a lot, people. A lot, a lot of people are. Not. Great many people wake up and they go to their device. I wake up and I meditate for twenty minutes with my wife. Yeah, me too. <laughs> we haven't we haven't talked at all yet. We're not speaking to each other. We just sit there quietly and meditate for twenty minutes. With our mantras, separate mantras, same meditation, TM, and we get into it and we feel ready for the day. Um, we open the day in silence. It's crucial to do that. And, yeah. and and it's crucial to take your phone at night and put it in a different room. Let let the alarm wake you up and you have to get up and go to the different room. You know, yep. it, my, my issue is that, that we have forgotten how to be kind to one another. We have lost the art of empathy towards someone in pain. We have lost the ability to communicate with our elders properly and learn and gain wisdom from them because we'd much rather be playing Fortnite. What do you, what do you think? So, so do you think that this, when you start looking at this, you know, epidemic around suicide, do you think that this is just, there's an erosion? I mean, obviously it's always been a problem, right? but it seems like it's getting worse. Statistically speaking, it's getting worse. What are you blaming the erosion of the family, of the erosion of communication? What, what in your mind is like when you see this, this problem you're trying to solve, yeah. right? Which, and, and doing so successfully from the sense of you're saving hundreds of thousands of people's lives through your content, your, your talk, your communication, but at the same time, more and more people are committing suicide. There's more, I mean, we're hearing the data out there is pretty scary, right? Like, what do you, how do you think, what do you think, like that being your calling, what do you think about that? There is a great benefit to the technology of man and its amazing advancements. Great benefit, no doubt about it. There are apps and websites and platforms that can benefit your brain health, do you wonders, benefit your memory, change your life forever. But there is a dangerous and dark side of all of that. That is that is a, that is really um, uh, it, 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 it is uh, attacking youth and kids in in the place where they need to be more centered and 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 fine tuned it's attacking their brain's neurotransmitters it's affecting their neurons and their synapses in their brain as they're just growing up into adulthood their brains don't fully develop until they're 26 and their brains are being completely manipulated by social media and 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 media and social media is the least social aspect of this actual life Right. If we, if we don't understand that every parent should have that, I, I don't even know what the app is called, but there's a few of them, a couple of apps where you can look at what your child is looking at online at every second they're on. So you know, and you can block certain things from being seen by them. The problem is most parents are unaware of this technology and, and its effect on children and its effect on the neuroscience in the brain. So they are allowing their children at 11, 12, and 13 to join these social media sites, not comprehending the shift and change that will occur in their behavior because of what they are seeing and consuming all day long. Right. No, no mobile device should be in a classroom. None. No, I None. agree. I agree. None. Yeah, there's they no reason. Work. Make, they need make them turn it they in. Need, they need a teacher that is present with them, and they need – uh, to be devouring knowledge. We have lost the, the idea of devouring knowledge. Everybody wants the fast forward button. Look at how people listen to podcasts now on, on, on five times as the speed. Nobody has the time they're, and energy anymore. They're screwed if they listen to this podcast on anything more than 1.3 because I talk fast. <laughs> so, I mean, like, like, like absolutely fucking screwed. Like, it's an impossibility that they can do it. At least but, when I'm talking, they're going to miss everything I say. Come on, you um, got it. So. <laughs> but anyway, you get my point. I, I don't want to keep beating a dead horse. Yeah, but yeah. We have an opportunity as, uh, as, as family members to take the children in our lives. I have two godchildren. I don't have any kids, but I have two godchildren who I love dearly. Um, 
and they're on social media too much and they're playing too many video games. And I want them to learn about being near other people, having a full on conversation instead of just yes and no answers, which get them nowhere. Where's the critical oh, thing? You know, agreed. Let me, let me ask you a question. Um, so what do you, so for, for there's probably listeners out there that are either know someone or they themselves are going through a situation where they're fearful that one of their kids might be suicidal or, or they know someone that's going through that. What, what, what advice do you have for people that are dealing with that situation? Tell us a little bit about that. Yeah. So I think that one of the biggest things you can do if you know someone who you think is considering suicide, you have to look, if we don't have the conversation at the breakfast, lunch and dinner table about how to stop suicide, then people are going to keep dying. If a family is unwilling to be vocal about their pain or their child's pain, be empathetic, listen to understand, not to respond. Don't give advice. They just need you to be there in the moment, off your phone, focused on their needs. You can say, what do you need from me right now? And you want to say, hey, you know, I'm worried about you. You know, you've been showing signs of, of, of odd behavior. The teachers have reached out to me. We don't know what's going on. I'm going to ask you three direct questions. I want your honest answer. No bullshit. And just know you're not in trouble for however you answer. No judgment is coming from this end. Say what's on your mind. Are you thinking of killing yourself? Have you ever made plans to take your life? Do you have the means? Statistically, it's proven to get more truthful answers than the questions, are you thinking of suicide and are you thinking of self-harm? Because the taboo on the word suicide and by definition, self-harm is not suicide, it's self-harm. It can lead to suicide. But my point is those three questions, are you thinking of killing yourself? Have you made plans to take your life? Do you have the means? Absolutely, in that order, with that preface, save lives. And, and let me ask you a question. So do you think that some, what type of behavior, I mean, you know, like teenagers also, and I'm guessing this, this is something that it really people start to, see more often with teenagers teenagers are hormonal a lot of the i have friends who's they're like oh my kids don't talk to me anymore you know and like they, you know they go away and they want to be around their friends and then they act really moody um what what's so, what are some of the maybe most important or like red flags that if if that you think people should be looking out for because i mean i've had people the ones that i've seen are friends or where the, the kid will say something to, to someone like like that they like they'll say it to their nanny or they'll say it to a friend's a friend who says it to their parents. So they're hearing they're they're that's how my friends are finding out about it with their kids when, 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 when it's come up, I'd like to hear like, what are the red flags that you know of that given that your expertise in this area? So I'll give you my prime example. Uh, when I was initially suicidal, I kept repeating to people, I don't like this life anymore. Oh shit. Okay. I hate this life. I don't want to be here. I hate myself. And I think people were somewhat in tune to it, but they never experienced it before. So they didn't know what to make of it. Like, oh, you're right. fine. It'll get better. You know, that shit doesn't work. When someone tells you, I don't like this life anymore. I don't want to be here. I don't like this existence. I, don't, I hate myself. You need to act now. Are you thinking of killing yeah. yourself? Have you plans to take your life? Do you have the means? Tell me the truth. I'm here for you. I got your back. So uh, when, 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 when someone goes from eating three square meals a day, two, meal, two snacks in between those square meals, to not eating at all or eating very little, those, that's a sign. When someone goes uh, from you know, exercising every day to not exercising at all, that's a sign. When it's, it's, okay. it's, a, it's, a, it's a shift. It's a massive shift in behavior. Right. Interesting. So okay. when they go from talking a lot to their parents, from telling them everything to telling them nothing, that's a sign. 
we have to be, and, and here's the other thing. I want to be very clear here because we have to be uh, sensitive to all of the parents at home right now, whether they're listening or watching this, that have lost their children to suicide, lost their spouses to suicide, lost their family members to suicide. It was not your fault. They did not die because of you or in spite of you. They died because of a lethal emotional pain that had nothing to do with you. Take that guilt and that blame game out of the, out of the conversation, off the table, brush it off your shoulders. It doesn't belong to you. Right. We can't go back and change the past. I know I have lost 16 people I care deeply about to suicide, one of them being my own cousin. So if we do not begin as a society amidst this many suicides around the world, if we do not begin to have these conversations at the breakfast, lunch, and dinner table on a regular basis, not semi-regular, regular basis, because moods of these kids and adults alike shift every day. More people have been diagnosed with clinical depression than ever before. More uh, more eight to 10 year old children are dying by suicide than ever before. We have to act and we have to act right now. If we ignore the problem, if we don't talk about it, more will die. If we open so up the you... conversation in, a, in an educational, non sensationalistic way, we can have the effect of keeping someone here. So, what do you think? So, so with that being the case, like, what can the average listener right now? Because I mean, like, I've never, with the exception of being a part of certain other people going through this situation, or me hearing about people taking their lives, there's nothing proactively I've done outside of bo probably booking the show with you to that I could say, like, stop suicide from happening. What can the average listener do if they want to, that, that would be easy for them to do if they want to make an impact? In, in, in stopping this from happening. Because to your point, like eight to 10 year olds, I have a nine year old and I have a 13 year old. These are, I mean, these are kids, man. Like they're yeah. little, 13, 13, they're, less, they're teenagers, but, but a nine year old's a little kid. Man. That's a little kid. And, and you know, like, so if, if, if this is a problem that's getting worse, which it is, what can the average listener do if they want to try to make an impact to stop this from happening? Cause this is to your point, man. Like, I cannot imagine. I'm going to tell you, I'm going to be vulnerable for a second here. So my, in my family, my, um, actually on Monday was the three-year anniversary of my brother-in-law's death. He, was, he would be 49 years old. And he passed away from cancer unexpectedly during COVID while he was on a trip. So this is fucking gnarly shit that happened. And it was the first time in my life, there's two things that have happened in my life that taught me something pretty profound. Number one was when I had my first kid, I realized for the first time in my life what it was like to love something more than myself. First time ever. And, and, and I always tell people who say they don't want to have kids, I go, it's a feeling I can't explain. And the only way you'll know is if you do it. Because I was a person that didn't really want to have kids. And then I did it and it changed my life. The second thing I, I learned was watching my mother-in-law after her son passed away. And, and I said, oh, that's the first time I've seen someone lose a child face to face. And people always say, you never want to see someone outlive their kid. And it's because of, it's the inverse of that, of that situation of having a child, which is the pain yeah. associated with losing something that you love more than yourself. So I can only imagine, and that, and then this was the, the, the not even having the complexity around it's whose fault it is or anything like that. Right. Um, which you have with sometimes with suicide so I can only imagine that there's hundreds of thousands of people, maybe millions of people out there that are going through the pain of, of or potential pain of losing a, a, a child to this. So I view it as an epidemic. And if there's something an average listener can do to stop it, I would love to hear your thoughts on that. Okay. I think the biggest thing you have to do is from the moment your child can comprehend language, Teach them how to be resilient in the face of pain. Mm. Teach them how to survive 
struggle, strife, and pain. Teach them that pain is inevitable. Suffering is optional. It's a choice. Everybody experiences pain in their life. It's how they get through it that is not taught to our children anymore. They get bullied at school. They take their lives. They get bad grades. They fear the repercussion. They take their lives. They get a breakup with a girlfriend or boyfriend. They take their lives. We are no longer educating our children on how to survive whatever ails them. What do you think was different 25 years ago, though, Ben? Like, I'm curious on that because, like, the things you just talked about, I mean, I'm going to use one of the bullying, but I got fucking bullied hard. My parents' advice was get, always get, get the first punch in. <laughs> I mean, like, that's literally my mom's <laughs> advice to me when I got bullied. She said, you better yeah. get the first punch in. My dad told me to poke the dude's eyes out. I was 12. Yeah. <laughs> so, I mean, that's like, 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 that wasn't great advice either. But, I mean, it served me. I did get the first punch in. But, but, but I, I, I mean, like, how do you, like, what, like, I, when you say that, my brain's like, I mean, it's fucking crazy. I feel like bullying was worse when we were kids. You know, oh, I think so why is worse. it different now? It's much, it's much worse now. It's following the kids home. It's on social media. It's cyberbullying that tells kids oh, to go kill you. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. It's cyberbullying. Yeah, yeah, sorry. More da- cyberbullying is 60% more dangerous than physical bullying. We didn't have wow. that back okay. then. Now they follow you home no, and they no, follow no. 24 hours of your life. And then everybody everybody puts in their input. Everybody puts in their 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 troll, their uh, meme, their whatever, and it destroys uh, these kids because they they see the social media as the their entire world. The fuck it's that. their entire ecosystem. Everybody's on it. Everybody's involved. That's why nobody under eighteen should be on social media. Hard. I know I'm going to get flack for this. I don't give a fuck. No, no, no. I'm, I'm with you. Like my my kid, my thirteen year old has. A, ha- Utah just made it made it against the law for children under eighteen to be on social media without parents' consent. And even with that consent, yeah. the parents should have the app that determines what the kids are allowed to or aren't allowed to see. There's too much garbage on those places for them to easily obtain and augment their brains. We don't get it. Yeah. It's, it's, it's it's chemical. Yeah. Well, no, it, it makes a lot of sense, right? Because social media is, it you know, you get the same dopamine hit. It's, dude, it's built by scientists that used to go and work for NASA to try to addict you addict you to it. It's so by it's built to be also built by psychologists to keep you on it yeah yeah yeah. Psychologists no, designed... what what kind of a great psychologist gets paid by a social media company no matter how much they're being paid to augment kids brains it's so fucked yeah it's super fucked man that's why no I, I'm, I'm with you man i don't think kids should be that's why media. you and me we create media that helps people right now that's amazing yeah. and it's available for anybody to see anywhere in the world and people can find it every, everywhere they go. And that's great. So let's keep doing that. Let's just get, let's inspire more people out there with beautiful voices that need to be heard because everyone's story is important. I'm just the guy with the mic right now. Yeah. You know? Yeah. Shit. And um, so, so going back to the, the average person, you think it's obviously they can, potentially take their kids on social media. But what is What do you think that average person, like they want to like help kind of, you know, what's the easiest thing they can do to help minimize this cause because or minimize this, this epidemic? Because I think that the average listener probably feels a little helpless where they're like, I don't know. So yeah. like, if, yeah, what do I do with my, you know, what do I, what what I do when my kid comes home and is considering this? And well, you have to have the conversation on a regular yeah. basis or else you could lose your child. That's a fact. Nobody nobody is immune to dying by suicide. When, when you said before building resilience, what are your thoughts around how do you do that? Because I mean, I mean, there's yeah, books absolutely. like Angela, du- Angela Duckworth has the book Grit. That's a great book around resilience. And it yeah. teaches how kids, kids build resilience. What are your thoughts? Some of the best things you can do are uh, A, getting your children into, into, uh, 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 into martial arts. Huge. Um, it automatically teaches them discipline and resilience. Um, and, and, and you don't even have to be there to do it, but you give them to a place that gives them the perspective on life, on how to survive any assault that comes their way. And verbal assaults are assaults, right? So how do they survive that? They have to be trained to do so, right? Never attack mm. someone, only use it in defense, right? But at least you can defend yourself from thoughts and ideas because you're being taught how to discipline the mind, 
not just the physicality of, of, of martial arts. You're being taught to discipline the mind and anything that comes your way, you can reflect or deflect. It doesn't, it doesn't hit you. It doesn't touch you the way it does a lot of these kids. So martial arts is a great way. Mindfulness, meditation is another way. All of the above. Building a, building a, a toolkit. Um, uh, like, for example, I created The Art of Wellness. Uh, you can find it at youtube.com slash Kevin Hines. The Art of Wellness 2.0, 17-minute video, 10 steps, science-backed, evidence-informed, proven to benefit brain health for anyone. Anyone. Nice. There's one step that doesn't apply to everyone. El Nine other steps apply to everyone watching right now or listening right now. Ten things you can do to lower stress, lower anxiety, lower depression, uh, balance bipolar, uh, balance mental health issues, brain health issues. Um, so, so like we we have to be proactive. We have to search out all of the ways to fight pain and then teach those things to our kids. I can't give you all the answers. But you, 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 you have YouTube University. It's easy as that. Find the stuff that is reputable, proven, science-backed, evidence-informed to change a life. Go after it. Devour that knowledge. You're an adult. Teach your child that immediately. I love it, man. Don't, don't, be, don't be a spectator, spectator in your child's life. Don't be a spectator in your pain because adults all over the world are struggling. Adults all over yeah. the world are silencing their pain. They're burying their struggles. Unburden yourself. Unburden your pain. Tell your truth to someone willing to empathize. And it's not always going to be the first or 10th person you find that's going to listen to you because not everybody is willing to empathize or, or, or sit with that pain. But by the sheer probability of the number of people you turn to, someone will get your back. How do I know that? For 23 years, Darius, I've lived with chronic thoughts of suicide since I left off that bridge but I've never attempted again. Never. Mm. There are two things that keep me here every time I'm suicidal. Number one, I look in the mirror and I say, my thoughts do not have to become my actions. They can simply be my thoughts. I don't have to attempt today. Number two, I turn to the first person next to me and I say, I need help now. Four simple but very effective words. I need help now. And, and it's not always the first person or the fifth person that gets my back. But I keep going until one person is willing to sit beside me until the moment passes. Because it is temporary. Yeah. I love that, man. And, you know, um, for all the people out there that reach out to me that say it's not temporary, that say they think about suicide 24 hours a day. Look, you have got to put in the work to change your mindset. You've got to look in the mirror and you've got to reverse your negative inner critical voice. You've got to do the work. You've got to get educated and you've got to train your mind to, to change your mind, to change your brain. The brain is malleable. We can shift our focus. We can change our perception and our perspective, but not without hard work. Yeah. And, and to your point, man, it's, it's, it is a, it's work. You got to go do the work. You know, and I think that, but and even if you're not at a point of being suicidal, because I think that's the extreme, right? There's for every one person that makes that decision, there's probably a hundred thousand people that are just depressed and not motivated and not and unhappy with their lives, and maybe yeah. they haven't hit the point where they want to end their lives. But but to your point, it's the the the, the anecdote's the same. You have to yeah. change your mindset. You have to be grateful for the life you have. And like what I see, what what really I love about you, man, is a, number one, I appreciate you sharing your vulnerability around the fact that this is still something that plagues you. And B, you still show up to do the work to go and make something valuable of your life. And it's a really valuable life we all have. And that's the hard part, you know, that people don't see that they can make a difference. And it only takes one person to make a difference. You're, you're a shining example of that, man. So thank you for that. Yeah, you bet, brother. You, you know, it get emotional because it breaks my heart when I – when I travel around the world and I and I speak in front of audiences of all sizes, especially high schools and grade schools, and these kids, they're broken. They're broken at at twelve, at ten, at fourteen. They have horrible home lives. They're being abused and neglected. Parents, get your shit together. No child should be abused or neglected. None. Verbally, physically, sexually, otherwise. Don't abuse your kids. 
if you're regularly abusing your kids, go go into recovery and get your shit together. You yeah, know, they're, you know they're... what though? I'll say this. I'll say this though, because I think that that if you're a kid that's dealing with this, or you, you know, because you know, a lot of people. I don't think people abuse their kids and have, I think there's a ton of baggage there around awareness and around their own ability to control themselves and their own anger and hate self-hatred and all that bullshit. And you can't control if you're a kid, right? You can't control like your parents, but if you're, but you can't control yourself, right? Yeah. So I think that that's, yeah. that's where it starts. Like, and I always tell people that I go, Hey, look, I'm a conscious leader and I'm, I'm about conscious leadership. I go, Hey, look, I can't control. I can't control what happened to me in my Ooh. past. You know, we all have our, we all have our struggles, yeah. um, but I can control how I show up, which is, which is, out of everything you've talked about today, I think that's the biggest thing is taking some accountability around building some resilience and building some strength and, and showing up to be, be your best, but doing the work. I think that's important. Yeah. And, and I appreciate the fact that you gave some resources for that. I know, I know we're running late here. Um, oh, so I want to, I want to, I want to honor your time. Um, you know, we, we end every show. Um, first of all, I want, I want to kind of give people the resources. So I want to do that in just a second here, but we, end. I don't know if I, I told you about the greatness question. Did I tell you about the greatness question before we started the show? Yeah. 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 Okay, cool. Cool. Sorry, man. I, I it's highlighted normally. It's not highlighted. So I want to, I'd love for us to, you might've already answered it, but I want to do our greatness question. And then I'd love to give the audience resources on ways they can, you know, find your work, connect with you. And, and really, and we'll make sure all this stuff ends up in the show notes. Does that work for you, man? Is that good? That sounds good. Absolutely. Awesome, brother. So uh, we always like to end the show. And first of all, man, like this has been incredible getting you, getting to spend time with you. I could go another 30 minutes, but I, again, I, I want to honor the fact that it's, we're, it, we're, we're on a Friday right here. So I want to honor <laughs> your time um, and you're on the East coast. So, so it's running late, um, but let's do the greatness question. So the greatness question is such. What is the number one barrier to creating great greatness that you overcome in your life? And how did you overcome it? The number one uh, barrier to greatness in my life was self-loathing and negative self-talk. Um, I hated myself for a long time. And it wasn't until I read the book, Conquering Your Inner Critical Voice by Dr. Robert and Lisa Firestone, a father and daughter uh, therapist team that I truly understood how the brain works and how if you recite and repeat something, you believe it. If we recite and repeat only hateful, negative, horrible, mean, nasty, angry things to ourselves, what are we going to believe? Congruently, if we recite, repeat, positive, hopeful, powerful, meaningful, loving, caring, kind, compassionate, giving, forgiving things to ourselves, that's also what we'll believe. And so I had to shift the way I talk to myself. I had to shift my self-talk to empower me to be the best I could be, to be great. From I went from one speech a year to 345 a year all around the world. And I went from self-hating to self-loving. And even though I still fall back into that pit sometimes and those suicidal ideations still come and get me, I break free from them because I will never not ask for help. I will always beg, plead, and ask for help. But I also recognize today I'm the only one that can save myself. Take ownership of your life, people listening and watching. Take ownership of your ability to survive your pain every single time. Realize your true value, that you are worthy, that you are loved, that you matter, that you are important, that you're meant for this world. Hell, we have a one in 400 trillionth of a chance of being birthed in this world, scientifically speaking. You have a one in 400 trillionth of a chance to exist. That existence is not to simply end your life, period. It's not meant to happen. It's an, it's an abomination in this world. It's appalling. It shouldn't occur. It needs to stop. And that stopping starts with you. We can yeah. all be great. We can all be great. 
and I know it's a cliche and I've said it many times, but you got to put in the work. I have. I love it, man. Such a, such a treat having you here spreading this word. And I just think it's such an important message that everyone needs to hear. And, um, it's been an honor to have you on the show. Um, a lot of gratitude for me. And I know it, hopefully I wish it would have happened 10 years sooner at the TEDx event, but it, it happened the way, happened the way it happened. So, um, I'd love to, uh, let's give the audience any way, ways they can connect with you, you know, the book, the movie, um, the podcast, anything, uh, you do a ton of speaking, any, any, and everything that we want to plug, let's plug that so people can connect and we'll make sure all this ends up in the show notes as well. And I'm going to do this. I'm going to actually put this episode out, uh, next month's mental health month. So we're going to put this out, uh, during mental health month, um, to, to help celebrate, you know, recovery for folks. And I'm, I'm excited to do that. So, um, yeah, Thank anything you. we can do to plug uh, the work you're doing, my friend. Yeah. At Kevin Hines story across all socials, K E V I N H I N E S S T O R Y. Uh, especially I G I, I do a lot of uh, really great work there with some reels that impact lives and then youtube.com slash Kevin Hines, 700, I think now 40 plus videos, all designed to benefit your brain health, take them. They're free. They're yours. Um, my website, KevinHindsStory.com, where you can book me to speak at any place all around the world. And then, uh, you know, uh, Hindsight's podcast is a growing podcast. Come check it out. We've got, I think, 102 episodes right now, and, and they're all fire. They're all amazing. And the guests we have have triumphed over incredible adversity. Um, and if you're interested in being a guest, if you've had a story that has changed your life, please reach out to the website, KevinHindsStory.com. Um, the book, Crack Not Broken. Uh, surviving and thriving after a suicide attempt is available for me to sign on kevinhindstory.com slash shop. We have a merch. It's okay to talk. And these messages, when they're worn, people come up to you from all over and they say, what does that mean? And you have a conversation about brain and mental health and it sparks an amazing potential friendship. You, you never know. Um, and, 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 and then, uh, you know, we, uh, my new book is coming out September 12th, the art of being broken, how storytelling saves lives. It's not just my story. I'm, I'm including stories from all, people from all walks of life who are included in my book and sharing their stories. So it's really uh, come full circle for me trying to not just put my message out, but messages from all over the world from people who've been through pain and survived it um, and how you can too. Appreciate that, my friend. Uh, you guys, so yeah, we're gonna make sure this all ends up in the, pod, or in the show notes for the podcast, but uh, go support Kevin. This is a, a really important cause that I think everyone needs to get behind. And uh, man, you're doing amazing work. So much gratitude from here at The Greatness Machine, my friend. Appreciate you. Thank you very much. And, and lastly, uh, if you do want to see the film we've made, uh, Suicide the Ripple Effect, uh, just go to Vimeo On Demand and you can rent it today. Awesome. Um, so yeah, hey, leaders, we're givers. Share this with anyone that needs to hear it and then some. Until next time. Peace out, everybody. We love you. You are listening to The Greatness Machine, and that's a wrap for today. Listen, if you love what you heard, subscribe to the show on whatever podcast platform that you're tuning in on so that you don't miss any of our future episodes. We have tons of great people coming on, and we're, we're stoked to have you here to enjoy it with us. Leave us a review. Tell us what you love most about this particular episode. We love getting the reviews. We love to see what you guys love most. And if this particular episode, you know, made you think of someone who's leveling up in their business and in their life, print screen, share it with them. Leaders are the best givers. And after all, we're all here to support and grow with each other. And in case you want to see some of the fun behind the scenes shots or some of the things that we're doing, I'm actually writing about this in my weekly newsletter. Go to www.therealdarius.com and subscribe to my newsletter. We're talking about fun things like business and life and mindfulness and cryptocurrencies and gosh, I don't even know everything and anything, but it's tons of fun stuff I write about. I try to get it out on a weekly basis. You can subscribe at www.therealdarius.com. And with that said, look, thank you guys so much. I appreciate you. I love you. Peace. We're out of here. See you guys on the next one. Uh -huh. She's my lover.